Um, okay, so uh, we're from Comcast. We're uh, presenting architectural considerations for big data workloads on OpenStack. Uh, my name is James St. Rossi. I'm a principal engineer for Comcast. Uh, and this is Jonathan Chang. Introduce yourself, sir. Hi, thank you uh, for having us. My name is Jonathan. I'm a cloud architect at Comcast. Uh, and uh, very excited to be here. Very tired. I'm sure all of you are, but we'll try uh, to get through this. Tired. Yeah, I'm a little under the weather, so if I'm a little monotone, that's why. I, I still love you guys, but... I, I want to give I'm some credit like... to um, the third person on this list who was actually supposed to give this talk, but uh, did not make it out. So Chris Power is missing in action. Um, so for, for video purposes, thank you, Chris, for putting right. us in this position. Right. So um, a little bit of what this is and what this, is, this talk is and what it isn't. It, it, it is going to be a, a bit of um, a prescriptive way of thinking about how we at Comcast, who've been doing OpenStack for quite some time, um, think about doing big data workloads. Uh, it, it's, it's a little bit of a shift for us. We've been uh, a, very much so a general purpose cloud for a couple of years, uh, for a few years. And you know, modern workloads, big data workloads, have really transformed the way that we think about doing OpenStack. So this is a little bit of prescriptiveness. What it isn't is a, a broad paintbrush that tells you exactly what you need to do in your infrastructure. Because right. you know, there is, a, uh, excuse my French, a shitload of uh, it depends, right? Right. That we've been weeding through for the past uh, couple of uh, weeks, think, uh, months, thinking about this. Right. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, we're going to do a little bit of a humble brag about Comcast. Um, we're going to talk about specifically our application profiles, and they're not going to be different than, than what you guys are running in, in your data centers. Um, and we're going to focus a little bit about um, disaggregated storage versus hyperconverged compute nodes, because I think that's where um, doing both is where the magic is. And we're going to give, like I, I stole said. stole my punchline. We're going to wait. <laughs> I'm going to wait to the, the, uh, the middle of the slide deck for that. I heard uh, somewhere you need to tell them what you're going to say, then tell them, and then recap that. And I mean, so it's up there, that, too. Yeah. So. <laughs> and it's so um, we're, uh, uh, we're going to give you guys our, our prescriptions, and, and we, we hope they're useful. And, and right. if not, you know, it depends. And um, James is going to dive a little bit deeper into disaggregated right. storage, specifically with um, you know, S3 and Swift. I'm the gardener. I'm going to get into the weeds. Yeah. So we're Comcast, NBC Universal. Um, we are uh, one of the nation's largest video high-speed internet and, and phone provider. Um, and with the acquisition of NBC Universal, we are a bunch of cable channels. We are a, a couple of studios. Uh, we own a few theme parks and, and, um, and a, a sports team or two. Um, this is our current OpenStack deployment. We are. Um, over a petabyte of memory, uh, more than a million CPU cores. Um, we have multi-petabyte Ceph. That's one of our, uh, that's our primary storage backend. Um, and we also do uh, multi-terabytes of SSD backend. So mm -hmm. we're deployed across 34 uh, national and regional data centers. Um, and today, we're actually still running on IceHouse, but we are moving to Mataka. Well, another conversation. Um, we are uh, very proud of our community comp contributions. Um, as of uh, maybe a week ago, we're, we're at about 95,000 lines of code, um, 1,200 commits. We have core people on, on projects like OpenStack, uh, Ansible. And we're very active in the community as well. I mean, in uh, uh, 2015, we won the Super User Award. Um, also, we contribute, even outside the Big Ten, we contribute to uh, Ansible with um, uh, OSA and uh, Ceph Ansible as well. So, you know, fundamentally, we're not going to cover all the use cases we have for big data. I think we're going to try to cover the ones that I think are pretty common across uh, uh, the user base, right? So, obviously, Kafka, we have, you know, 30 million plus set top boxes, all of which we're collecting network telemetry, right? All of which we want to make real time decision, decisions with um, um, to tell us if the network is performing well or performing poorly. And, so, um, and obviously we need some place to store that data and do map reduce functions against it. And um, this thing here on Pulsar where the font didn't really come through, um, Pulsar is our, our own, you know, version of a, a NoSQL database. Think of it as Cassandra. And yeah. so James is going to deep dive into a little bit of the application profiles while I All drive right. the slides. All right. So our first uh, application profile is Kafka. Um, <clears throat> so. We have a lot of sequential writes. We have uh, 
uh, you know, 100% sequential writes, very high write workload. And that's very typical of some of our workloads is, is we do get um, very heavy write workloads. And a lot of storage systems really aren't designed um, with that in mind. They assume that uh, there's going to be a um, balance, like a 70-30 split or something like that. Um, so for Kafka also, uh, latency is a very important consideration for us. So that, that factors into a lot of our uh, uh, decisions uh, regarding the, uh, the, the storage aspects of it. Uh, we do use uh, separate ingest and consumption um, clusters, I guess. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so that's where we are with Kafka. Um, yeah, and I'll get to our separate uh, ingest and consumption in a later slide. All right. Now we have, uh, we have Pulsar. Um, Pulsar is a highly scalable, no SQL database service uh, um, for products that need eventual consistency and interactive latencies at scale. Yeah, I'm not so involved on in the Pulsar pro project, so I'm kind of reading, reading from my <laughs> notes here. Um, so it's, uh, it's a database as a service with geo replication between national data centers and intra DC replication for high, uh, for local high availability. Uh, Pulsar is API compliant clone of AWS's uh, DynamoDB service running in Comcast private cloud infrastructure. So obviously, you know, we're trying to find ways of cutting costs to not be giving so much, uh, you know, of our, of our budgets to the um, AWS here. Um, all right. You're probably not going to run this, but this is, you know, as he said, Cassandra. Um, all right, Hadoop. We do a lot of, we do a lot of Hadoop. Um, that's the one I'm, I've been mainly focusing on with Chris Power, uh, working closely with him. Um, yeah, I'll get into this in more detail later on. You guys probably know I do pretty well. Uh, you know, in our use case, low IOPS, very large blocks. Um, Yarn is a node manager. Um, uh, high performance admin nodes. Uh, we use Zoop, Zookeeper. Um, ah, the name nodes. Ah, the name notes. We'll get, we'll get to the name notes. Um, all right. So the, the key objectives for modern workloads. Uh, performance. So you have to ask uh, some questions, right? High performance at what cost? Is it worth the million, million dollars to get that high performance? Um, you know, you're going to have to decide on that, obviously. Uh, how many aspects of your latency do you control? So great. You know, you know, your group controls the, uh, you know, the deployment of the servers, but are you at the mercy of another group to do your, late, uh, to do your network deployments? Um, do you have any control over using something like RDMA to try and get your uh, latency down? Um, and that's kind of a holistic approach, right? You have to look at it um, through all aspects or know where your limitations um, are. Uh, so the other thing about performance is you really have to, um, you know, do your thorough testing, measure your performance in your test clusters, IOPS throughput, latency. These are the these are the key factors we're looking at. Is is those those three? Um, a lot of times it's people think IOPS and throughput, and uh, you know we'll have engineers that are benchmarking systems, and he'll say I got this terrific number of IOPS and we're doing this amount of throughput, and I'm like great, what's your latency? And he'll say one second, and I say no, one second, that's that's way too high latency. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's about performance. Um, availability, re reliability, resiliency. Um, exa uh, examine the fault tolerance and uh, uh, reliability of the storage system during component failures and software upgrades, right? So what happens when your name node goes down? You know, does your HDFS just go away? Do you have a backup? How hard is it, or the secondary, do you, uh, how hard is it to make the secondary the primary? Um, you know, is it acceptable for you to lose that availability? Um, software upgrades. How much of a pain in the rear is it to do your software upgrades? We see this uh, from multiple vendors where they have a very nice product and it looks really shiny 
and everything works great, but your software upgrades are just uh, really painful uh, for your operations team. And that's probably coming up. I might talk a little more later about that later. Um, so, uh, I mean, these are some of the things that are uh, trade-off uh, between, well, availability and performance. I mean, there's a compromise between those two, right? Um, does one size fits all in your environment, or do you need to start considering tiering or different clusters for, for different tasks? Uh, as Jonathan mentioned uh, earlier, we're uh, starting to sh shift from a generic OpenStack uh, system to more specialized OpenStack systems that will be able to deal with the individual use cases and uh, possibly changing the, the, um, the computes to uh, better handle that workload with like larger ephemeral or something similar or um, more expensive ephemeral for a subset of the computes. Uh, manageability, uh, let's see. Evaluate the management interface, programmatic API, and integration capabilities. Uh, can you use OpenStack auth to access the API, or do you need a, to set up a parallel auth system? Um, I've definitely seen systems where they kind of support OpenStack authentication, and you have to set up a parallel account on that system, and then it'll sync the passwords, and um, that, was, that was definitely a, a, a game ender for that for that one. Um, isolate your workloads or workload isolation. The noisy neighbor. Um, this is one of the big reasons why we're considering going to uh, more <coughs> specialized clusters. Again, we have 34 regions right now, so we're popping these things out once a month. Um, it just makes sense for us to start uh, specializing them a little bit, so we'll have one large tenant and then we'll squeeze smaller tenants in in the gaps instead of what we have been trying to do, which is set up huge, um, uh, huge regions and then be able to handle multiple heavy duty tenants. I'm going to jump in real quick and, and kind of add a little bit of color, I hope. Um, um, how did we come about these objectives? Well, these are very clear functional requirements that actually our team actually developed by deploying in Amazon first. Right, so there are a lot of optimization constraints by deploying in Amazon. You have to uh, realize, you have to understand the instance size. You have to understand things like um, the, the volume IOPS, right? And you have to optimize for cost. So those, having our teams run in Amazon first and architecting their application <coughs> to very, uh, to understand really clear functional requirements and then bringing them back to us and then letting us essentially compete for a, a lower TCO Right, value for, for that workload has really helped us drive a lot of these key objectives. Right. <coughs> um, data intensive applications. So you're going to see a little bit of a bias in these, in these slides towards looking at the storage aspects of the architecture. Um, we found that that is usually the, um, the largest question we're trying to answer. Um, you know, compute, CPU, memory, those are fairly easy. I mean, they're the bill of materials in your, in your compute node. Um, and they're, they're easy to predict. Storage tends to be a much more moving target. So we'll definitely talk uh, a lot about storage, and I think that that's one of the, the, the more um, interesting aspects of the, of the architecting of these systems. So disaggregated versus hyperconverged fight. So um, this obviously isn't what you want to do. Like, like, everybody should just get along. Right. Uh, I think when I first started uh, working on this project, uh, you know, I thought, oh, well, I'm going to, uh, you know, either try and replace HDFS completely with S3 and, and that's how I'll do it, or can I make HDFS do everything? Um, and uh, as with most things that, you know, black and white, it's never black and white. It's gray, right? So um, here's just a quick... Uh, example of what we mean, just to be very clear about hyperconverged versus disaggregated. Very clear, except for the magic, right? I, I like the magic. Um, so in our hyperconverged model, you know, compute and storage, they're all located, they're, they're co-located on the same node. Um, so this is standard HDFS, right? Uh, you probably have a name node sitting, sitting somewhere, maybe on one of the nodes. Um, disaggregated, 
So, so this slide was a real challenge. That's why the magic is here. So I wanted to communicate that you've got your big data nodes separated from your storage, and they're all completely interconnected. So I was sitting there, you know, drawing millions of lines. Instead, I just I used magic. So Stardust. <coughs> I hope you guys like the magic. Um, so examples, OK, HDFS, hyperconverged, so S3 um, in its many you know, varieties and flavors, however you're implementing S3 would be an example of the disaggregated. <coughs> Sorry, I'm coughing in your ears, by the way. Um, all right, so the recommended approach for Kafka. Um, it's definitely not, you know, as, as John alluded to, these are kind of the amalgamation of our research and uh, uh, some of our trials and tribulations. It's not a definitive guide. Um, people will always tell you, well, it depends on your specific use case. And, you know, yes, it depends on your specific use case, but hopefully we can shed some light on things that affect that use case instead of just leaving it at, you know, some vague uh, um, statement like that. Uh, so uh, for Kafka, we use kind of a divide and conquer. So we use uh, HDDs for the collectors, um, and that's because uh, they, um, oh, sorry, I'm reading my, reading my slide here, and I was like, I don't remember it saying it that way. Um, so it's, it's all stream data processing, so it's all, that's right, it's all sequential writes, so it's just flowing onto the hard drive as quickly it is, um, as it can get on there, and then it's, uh, I believe, it, you know, the, all the small writes get aggregated into larger blocks and then they get dumped on larger blocks. So uh, cost of, th there's, no, uh, there's no reason to go with SSDs on your collectors, um, I guess unless your ingest rate is just ridiculously fast and then somehow the SSDs would benefit you there. But chances are you can save some money if you go with uh, HDDs there. Um, because it's aggregating the rates in the larger blocks. And then um, we've got the consumption side. So that's the, the mirror maker and the aggregate. Um, and those are actually running S SSDs. And at first I thought this, this seems counterintuitive to me because you're taking the contents of two collectors and putting them on one aggregate. So you're going to need more storage space for that. But because you're querying that aggregate, you want it to be fast. And it's all going to be random, random I.O. So you're just, you're going to kill a hard drive, you know, with all this random I.O. because you've got these large blocks uh, that are going to be sitting there and you're going to be picking, you know, you're going to be doing a whole bunch of seeks into those blocks to try and get your individual records out of it. Um, okay. Um, all right. A recommended approach for Pulsar. So, um, this is, this is again one of these like, I can't really say definitely use this method or definitely use that method, right? There's, this is one of the is depends um, items. So uh, can handle a high number of IOPS, uh, meet the capacity, network latency issues can be uh, mitigated. Um, these are some of the advantages of um, the, the disaggregated. Uh, some others to consider are, you know, the cost. Uh, if you're going with disaggregated, then you've got a, a specialized cluster that's doing your storage, so you're not, you've got an economy of scale there, uh, hopefully. Uh, also, one would assume you've probably got more capacity on that side of it versus uh, the hyper-converged where it's really, well, how many drives can I fit in a 1U chassis for my compute? Um, uh, you've also got the flexibility. You can point it at another, um, uh, storage system. So let's say you want to use, uh, you know, Seth's uh, Rados Gateway versus uh, Swift Stack's uh, um, S3 implementation. Um, you've got that flexibility versus uh, the compute, the bill of materials was, you know, that was bought, that's been installed in your data center. That's going to be much harder um, until, you know, five years down the line when that, when that equipment is uh, accessed. Operations, um, again, these are advantages of the disk aggregated approach. Uh, operations, uh, you don't have to manage the decentralized storage. You're not going to have to write a million Ansible scripts to try and deal with um, the, the decentralized approach of that. Um, this was an interesting one. So VM scheduling flexibility. 
Um, and I kind of had a back and forth with Chris Powers, and I was like, what do, what do you mean? How, how does this work? And so this is basically referring to if you have, say, a 200 node cluster, and you've decided that 85 of those nodes, those computes, are going to have um, specialized storage uh, subsystem. So maybe most of your computes have hard disk drives and these, these computes, like 85 of them, have SSDs or NVMEs or something um, similar to that. That means that you're really, in, in terms of running your, um, you know, your map reduce jobs, uh, you will have to schedule those instances to be on those computes versus a disaggregated model where you can run them across your whole compute um, infrastructure for that region. All right, so now let's talk about hyperconverged. And uh, you know, the advantages are, are fairly obvious. So, so obviously it's gonna be much closer to um, hopefully the, the jobs you're running. Um, and this depends, there's, there's a little bit of a, a gotcha with HDFS in this. Um, but for the most part, you would expect like low latency um, because it's, it shouldn't be going over a network. Um, uh, so you know you've got SSDs, NVMEs, um, and as long you know go that way if you have enough capacity. Uh, again, you can only put so many disk drives or SSDs into that smaller chassis versus the disaggregated system where you can put thousands. It's whatever you want to scale that centralized system to. Um, advantages, simpler setup, right? You're just, it's just, it's just disks in a compute. Um, lowest latency and uh, possibly easier to scale. Um, and by that, it, you know, if you're just tacking on computes into your infrastructure, then that's a fairly easy task versus a lot of times uh, scaling out your um, disaggregated storage system can involve rebalancing and all the headaches uh, that come with that. All right. All right. So HDFS advantages: hyperconverged storage. Um, so native to Hadoop. Obviously, this is uh, that's that's uh, good in the sense that you have full support for any project that uses the Hadoop infrastructure. Everything's designed to run on HDFS. Right. Works with all the uh, Hadoop uh, storage formats, including Parquet or Car. Um, you're not going to have in, any incompatibilities. And this is a big difference for disaggregated where um, it won't work with uh, the three I just mentioned. Um, fast uh, can, can be, um, you can design it in such a way that the data will be co-located with the MapReduce daemon. It can be designed in such a way. So when you're writing into your HDFS, um, whatever point you choose to write to, that's where it's going to put the local copy. So if your ingest is separated from your MapReduce daemons, you could have a problem there. Um, it could be, um, it could wind up having to go over the network to actually access it. And then, then you lose all the benefits of that. So it's, you have to be very careful when you're designing that to make sure that you're writing to the place where you're going to read it and, that, and you'll, you'll get that benefit out of HDFS. Um, and that's not as easy as it sounds. Um, large file support, meh. Um, so there's no five gig file size limit. And that was true of the older S3 protocol for Hadoop. Um, S3A now supports the large files. So that's academic. I mean, yes, both will support uh, large files. Uh, let's see. Right. Okay. So the advantages of S3. Um, <clears throat> you have the option for erasure coding, uh, depending on your implementation. Um, but there is a huge savings there, right? So HDFS is going to use triple replicas. That's kind of the standard. <clears throat> so there, right there, you're only able to use one third of your, of your storage. Um, you can choose between various vendors. So again, you know, um, obviously AWS, uh, Ceph, uh, SwiftStack, probably some others. Um, eventual consistency, that's usually the case. There are systems that are strongly consistent. <coughs> it's probably not a, a, a super big deal, you know, assuming you're not, you're not doing your MapReduce jobs instantly once you do your ingest. 
Um, and even then, it's, it's probably okay. Uh, most, most of our clients that I've said, are you okay with eventual consistency? They're like, we're fine, it doesn't matter. Um, normally has very robust availability. And I forgot to mention this about HDFS. So you got your name node. And in my opinion, so the name node is where the, the metadata is kept for HDFS. And if your name node goes away, your, your HDFS ceases to exist until that name node comes back up. Um, it still has all the data, but you have no idea which block is where or any of that stuff. It's the index um, that, that directs to how to retrieve it. And there are, you know, you can set up a, a secondary and you can do a sync, a sync with that. Um, it's, you know, five, ten years ago that was the way you did this. And, but, but nowadays it's very, in my opinion, jinky. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a warm, it's kind of a warm backup and you have to manually fail it over. Um, most of the S3 uh, systems you're going to use have automatic redundancy, you're, not, you're barely even going to notice when a node goes down. They'll automatically pick another um, source for the data. Uh, you can lose you know, two nodes if you're using triple replication, uh, that kind of stuff. So that's definitely an advantage that S3 has, is, is you're not going to have to worry about um, uh, either um, the accessibility of your data or losing your data as much. Um, and then data is not tied to an individual node. Uh, you don't have to worry about the name node going down. All right, together, right? So this is really, uh, again, it's not really a question of like HDFS versus S3, fight, fight. Thank you. All right, um, I'm just here for that. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's really, there are places where HDFS <coughs> makes much more sense than, than S3, and there are places where S3 I think is much more beneficial. So um, in our case, using S3 for the data ingest and then um, the, the results. So it comes into S3 and it winds up in S3, but then when you're chaining your map reduce jobs together, that's where you use HDFS, right? Because you get the locality, so you're getting a performance benefit. You don't have to worry as much about the, the, the scale of the storage that, that um, HDFS needs. Um, and then it'll support the, the alter, alternative uh, storage formats. Um, so here they are, all happy. And this is, this is a little bit of a joke. He used to work at NASA. So I was like, I got to put the slide in here. <coughs> um, and then I, I kind of stole my own th thunder. So here's an example of what we're talking about where, you know, it goes from the S3 source, it goes bing, 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 bing on the HDFS, and then it comes back to S3. <coughs> And this is nice as well, so that if your name node has a bad day, um, hey, you've still got the results. You've still got the ingest, right? Maybe you have a way of pointing other resources at that same data source, and uh, you can provide some redundancy that way. Right, testing and validation. This, this was a challenge. I was trying very hard not to say, we use internal testing tools that aren't available to the public. And that, you know, it's like, what, what good is that going to do? Um, uh, we still do. So Hadoop testing, uh, we use a combination of standard benchmarking tools and application-specific testing. Um, <coughs> distributed, so the, the DFSIO, that's, the, that's a tool we use. Um, and that's used to test the performance of HDFS on the local ephemeral disk. Um, TerraSort. Uh, that's a general Hadoop benchmarking tool. Uh, tests overall performance of the cluster. Application testing. Uh, this is like the, you know, your results may vary. You got to test your application. Can't really help you with that. Um, and then for uh, Kafka, uh, Nmon and Tick stack are used for performance monitoring. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to give you all the open source tools that you guys can actually access. Um, and then we use Zookeeper for uh, config and sync and quorum and all that fun stuff. Um, all right. I think maybe worth mentioning is when we started off with this concept of a hyperconverged node, we, we um, wanted to actually pin a specific drive, whether it's an SSD or an HDD to a virtual machine. And in OpenStack, we discovered that's not possible. Well, it, it is possible, but it takes a ton of extra work. And that's one of the operational considerations you have to make, right? Is do you want to 
do a lot of you know hand jamming of every single instance type when you do an upgrade in order to pin those disks to specific workloads. So you want the A HDFS workload to run on a on a HDD, and you wanted the Kafka workload to run on an SSD. That was a, a very big consideration for us to make that we didn't want to do that, so we decided to go the opposite direction, and we decided to go with an individual compute node that it was filled with SSDs and another compute node that was filled with HDDs. So that's one of the operational considerations I want to bring up before he right. jumped into the questions. Right, operational considerations. That's Always worth considering. That's a space shuttle, isn't it? It is. Another, another, another jet. Hey, um, got to get in there. Uh, so operations and support at scale, um, noisy neighbor. We've had a lot of um, trials and tribulations with this. Um, this is one thing where I feel that um, there needs to be more work in OpenStack That's right. to deal with these situations. Uh, the the uh, QoS tools, um, especially when you're using something like multi-backend Cinder, the defaults, uh, the, there's, I think there's some pull requests to fix it, but, but multi-backend Cinder and the, and the QS defaults tend not to work as well um, as they could. Um, monitoring, you know, I'm sure we've all experienced um, what a challenge uh, monitoring can be. Uh, it is vital, vital to have very good monitoring. Um, right now we're, we're testing a system that has uh, one second updates um, and monitors the whole uh, OpenStack cluster for uh, CPU, memory, um, disk I.O. Um, and that's, that's so important because you'll have a customer that they figured out that you know, maybe their IOPS aren't capped or they've realized that they're uh, the multi-backend sender. So if you have one storage type that is SSD and one storage type that is HDD, um, the, the default will say Let's say you set your default at one terabyte of, of you know, um, quota. You can only have one terabyte. But the default has no way of delineating between those two different types. So your user can then say, well, I'll, I'll pick one terabyte of SSD. Now, obviously, you could fix this by going in after the fact and setting it. You can set the individual um, QoS for the individual uh, storage types. But then that's another step. It can get left off. In our case, it was left off, so we had um, a lot of pains kind of migrating uh, uh, tenants out of what they thought was one storage type back into another. Um, and so let's say you have a tenant and they've asked for quota and then you have another tenant and they've asked for quota and they both sit there for six months, you know, waiting for that intern to, to, to come back or whatever. And then they both fire up their... Um, uh, they both fire up all their instances at the same time. And this is where all these automation tools that are currently getting developed can be a real headache, right? Because if you give these tenants, say, 100 instances apiece, and they're using automation tools to fire those up and have them all do something at the exact same time, well, you can exhaust your um, uh, storage, uh, storage backend um, and then there are definitely several storage backends where you have no idea. It just doesn't have the resolution. Um, for the S3 systems, it's all super distributed, right? So, so the writes are going all over the place. So how do you actually pull those metrics back out? Um, and that was a really uh, tough problem. Uh, the way we solved it was actually to monitor on the OpenStack side and, and have listeners on each and every client that, was, that were looking at the metrics that each hypervisor was producing and then aggregate that completely outside of our storage systems. That also has the advantage, say, if you have a block storage system and a, um, an S3 storage system, you can, you can look at both types. And you can also look at ephemeral as well um, versus if a vendor provides you very nice graphics for their product, well, okay, that does it for that one use case. Um, do you have DevOps? I mean, what, what's... Uh, Again, these are, you've deployed your system. It's now a year down the line. Uh, how do you keep these things running well? Uh, you know, having smarter operators, or not smarter operators, but, but our operators that are, I guess, more well-rounded and aren't afraid to get, you know, further than the, the SMOP, um, I think that that's, that's a great benefit. Um, having them tied closely to 
the engineers. One thing that I've, I've really appreciated the way we do things in Comcast is we sit next to our operations group. Like, that guy is on, on the other side of my cube wall. So when he has a question, he can just ask me. He's not in a far off land or anything like that. Um, when things start to break, um, well, it's pretty standard. I mean, what do you do? Um, this involves, uh, you know, how good was your testing? Did you pull the drives, uh, you know, out of either the compute or the, uh, the S3 uh, cluster and see what happens? Um, uh, a, a funny one is um, you've got a drive that's failed and Linux is telling you it's dev SDD. Now, which one of those slots is dev SDD? Because you have to tell your remote hands guy, hey, I've, I, you know, I'm, I'm here to pull the drive, and there are four drives. Which one do you want me to pull? Right? You can't tell him dev SDD. He's not going to be able to get it. So you have to uh, blink the locator light and um, ask that question. That's, that's always a fun one. I say, how do I, how do I find the drive? How do I pull it? Right? And it's one that... Uh, some, I, I was very impressed because recently a vendor had an automatic tool that when a drive goes out, it turns on that and starts blinking that light. And that's great. I mean, I'm a thousand miles away from my data center, right? I'm going to call the guy who does the push buttons and stuff, and, and the, the level of his knowledge is going to be pulling a drive and putting a new drive back in and maybe making sure the serial number is right. Um, so synthetic workloads. Uh, that is um, so important, obviously. Uh, when, when I go into meetings with my internal customers, because uh, we're mainly internal customer focused, um, I have uh, all these synthetic workloads we've done and pre-qualified on a system. And I say, well, what block size do you, do you use? And if they tell me the block size, I have a little list I can go down and go, uh, 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 uh. Okay, we can handle that block size and we can do this IOP. And I did it for every single block size, from 4K to 8 meg. Right? So right in that same meeting, I can answer that question. And I know if I'm out of my depth. Um, you know, and, that's, and that's true of your compute as well, um, you know, obviously in terms of, of memory. And uh, well, I don't know. You probably don't worry too much about the speed of your memory. I worry about the speed of my storage um, and going over a network. But that's another story. Um, all right, so to recap. Uh, we've given you our application profiles um, and our solutions, uh, or at least some, some general recommendations. Um, storage recommendations, that's, that's my forte. Um, and then uh, some operational considerations. And, you know, we essentially told you we have to do everything right now, right? There's no right. magic to uh, a single storage vendor or a, a hyper-converged, uh, you know, infrastructure provider. Um, you know, as we evolve, we've realized that, that you know, um, in order to meet these new applications, we have to get away from that general purpose model that we had for, for many years and, and start thinking about, you know, almost bespoken infrastructure. And so that's um, it's a bit chaotic, you know, managing multiple SKUs and, uh, for, for server builds and, and dealing with... Uh, um, um, multiple storage vendors, um, which is pretty much uh, in our conference today, <laughs> <laughs> this week. I tried to save you guys. Um, but um, so yeah, we hope that was helpful. We, um, yeah. we appreciate the time that you guys have spent here, and I think we are right. feeling. It, it's perfect. Well, we're one minute over, but that's yes. not bad. We didn't actually time this ahead of time, so that's, that's, that's pretty good. Pretty good high five. All right, All right. here are our slides.